the trust members in. <clears throat> so now let's see if we have some attendees. More bigger me, Lucas. Welcome, whoever it is who's in the attendees room, if you can hear me, I don't even know. I think you can. I am going to wait until we get some, get the trust members here. Hey, how come I can't promote? I'll make you oh, I'm not a host. I'll make you a co-host. I'll make you the full host when I go. Okay. Well, then, so, go. okay. So I can promote to panelist Allegra, who is one of us. I think I did that. Is she coming in? Looks like, yep. Okay. Hello. Hello, Allegra. Good evening. Good evening. How are you? I'm I'm okay. Trying to be okay. Trying to do this without Erica and without Nate. Oh. <laughs> I'm a little more stressed than usual, but <laughs> other than that. Is so it, let's see. So Erica's out of town today, is that right? Or she's yeah, she's on a, an amazing vacation. So I'm sure she's having a good time. I'm glad for that. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, and Laura Baker and May Lucas are in the attendee room, but I think we need some more trust members in order to get started. I have only heard from, I mean, I know Erica isn't going to be here, and I heard from Paul that he's not going to be here. Mm -hmm. But I'm, Risha's going to be here because she's going to present something, mm -hmm. I believe, so... And I haven't heard anyone else say that they wouldn't be here. Is so the quorum hopefully three for the trust. How many members are there? Uh one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's eight, but two of them won't be here. So well, Robin. Here Richard, oh, here, here's Arisha. And here's Rob. Okay, so we have a couple more people. Hello, Risha and Rob. Let's see, we should have, uh, I expect we will have, oh, I'm here, aren't I? <laughs> Ashley and <laughs> Grover. <laughs> yeah, we need, we need five for a quorum. So we need to have a quorum, we need at least one of Grover or Ashley. I'm pretty sure Grover is planning to be here. We talked the other day. And Mindy Dom is now. Hello, Mindy. Thank you for being here. Risha, I've made you a co-host so you can um so you can share your screen later. But by the way, I'm a I'm just a Amherst staff member. I'm just helping get the meeting set up because Nate couldn't be here. Awesome. Thank you. Hey Rob. Oh. <laughs> Who else we need? Oh, we need also George. Hopefully George. He said he was coming, didn't he? I think I, George Ryan. I had a hard time with the link in the email. I had to get in through a different mechanism. So it, it could be that other people faced the same uh -huh. thing. Okay. Well, that did you have trouble, Rob? I was a little stymied at first because it says, um, if you're the host, go ahead and start it. And then in tiny little letters at the bottom, it says, if you're not the host, click here. And I didn't see that pull <laughs> up. Aha. Uh -huh. Well, that might have been what happened to me. I tried to get in a little early, and I, I said, if you're if you're the host, put in a bunch of stuff that I didn't have. But then I got a hold of Steve. <clears throat> but maybe people are having problems. I don't know. Hmm. Who else would we be expecting tonight? Well, at least we should see Grover, Wellman Brown, and Ashley Jensen Eldridge. Those are the trust members that I expect. And I'm Ashley always comes. She hasn't said she wasn't coming. I expect she'll come. And I talked to Grover Is last Grover? night anyway. There's All Grover. Right, All right. And, um... 
There's Grover. And George Ryan, I'm glad to see us here because he will be our note taker. Thank you so much, George. You know, he likes to stay where he is in the as an attendee, but he's our note taker. Welcome, Grover. Hi, apologies. I had a Zoom snafu, but I'm here now. You're Did not you have trouble. Did you have trouble getting into this meeting? It's more like Zoom had just like logged me out and sent me on a little maze back in. Oh, okay. What well, because other people had trouble getting in too. So I'm just wondering if that's hmm. an issue tonight for whatever reason. That's what happened to me too. So it sounds like the same thing. Okay. Well, you guys did better than I did. I got I got like, ah, this doesn't work and tried to get a hold of Steve. <laughs> um well, I guess that we could, we have a, we have one, two, three, we have five, so we can go ahead and start. We have a quorum. We'll just keep our eyes out. If somebody sees Ashley and I don't, or after uh, Stephen, as long as Stephen's here, he can, he can watch for her. But um, I think we should go ahead and get started because it's 7.05, so I'm going to call the meeting to order at 705. Welcome everyone and let's see what we can do here. We have a note taker who is in the attendees, George, and we have hopefully all looked at the minutes from last time that were Rob's, I think. Well, I get the meetings mixed up. Uh, so if everyone has had a chance to look at the minutes, is there any, are there any comments, any changes anybody wants to see anything that needs to happen to the minutes before we accept them i'm seeing no nothing or other uh are the minutes acceptable as presented we could just do i am seeing thumbs up from all five of us in the room i'm going to consider that that means that the minutes are approved <laughs> And um, the next thing on our agenda is delightfully a presentation from Risha, who, well, Risha, I'll let you talk about what's going on for you, but I'm also, I believe you can now share your screen. Does that look true? Can you? Did you... I, can, I can do my screen. Uh... Okay. When you say share things that are going on with me, is that a secret code? Are you, or should I just start my presentation? Well, I wondered if you wanted to talk about your tenure here and your new. So that's what uh, I was referring earlier, to. Earlier this week, I was uh, appointed to the board of health for Amherst. Um, I am a health person, so that makes a lot more sense. Um, I had. Um, taken a, a conversation that we had as the trust to heart um, a few months ago where it was talked about needing representation from people with more lived experience. And I come at this purely from an interest standpoint. Um, I, I have people in my life who need affordable housing, but I don't have the lived experience. Um, and so this will be my last meeting. I am going to transfer over to the Board of Health. Um, and I I'm going to attempt to join your strategic planning as a community member because I'm interested. Um, but uh, I am I'm sad to to go, and I'm excited to give this presentation as well, which has nothing to do with me leaving. Um, Thank you very much. Okay, so let me figure out how to do this. Can you see my presentation? Yes, great. Um, so I just want to make get my notes out. Okay, I am going to talk fast. I am going to skim over things that you're going to want to look at longer. Um, and I'm going to ask that you hold your questions till the end uh, so that there is actually time for questions and we don't get sidetracked and then bigger picture questions don't get asked. Um, especially for those of you who um, did not get this ahead of time, I don't know if anybody did, um, The I did send it ahead of time to, but I don't know how that works. 
Um, it, I assume this would be posted on the, the town website with our meeting minutes and all of that. And so if there are slides that you'd like to look at longer with data on them, those are the ones I'm thinking of specifically, you can spend more time there or just reach out and I'm happy to email it to you. So um, I've been uh, stewing on this for quite a while. In February, uh, two pieces of data came out almost at the same time and they sort of sparked thoughts in my head. The first was this uh, MHP data town data set. If people aren't familiar with it, there's a lot there. Uh, it's really interesting. Um, and the thing that sparked for me was the uh, the age demographics. And obviously we are a college town. This is very well represented in that left graph. We have mostly college age people in our town. But um, I played with the data set a bit on, on the graph on the right and um, the percentage change aren't huge. I mean, if you look at the the axis there, it's only about 1% um, at the highest level, but our growth is all coming from seniors. Um, and everyone I have spoken to says that, A, this is a, a countrywide trend, and B, it is moving exponentially, um, that this is really going to go up. The other piece of data that came out in February of this year was this age and dementia-friendly Amherst uh, senior survey, as we were calling it. And um, the things that struck me from this were how important is it for you to be able to stay in your own home? 83% uh, said very or extremely. So the vast majority of people want to age in home. Um, a lot of people skipped the next question around needing services, but those who did needed some pretty basic services, yard work, lighthouse work, those kinds of things. And then this is the worst graph. I will walk you through it. Um, and this is where seniors live now in Amherst, the type of residence, and where they see themselves in five years or where they'd like to live in five years. And I have ordered it from the bottom to the top as the largest positive changes. So where they, people are hoping to move to most is into senior independent community, like the largest growth area, followed by locations that are accessible to stores, et cetera, followed by assisted living, apartments, condo townhouses, accessory apartments, group homes, and co-housing. And where are they moving from is this big thing at the top, which is single family homes. So people who are in single family homes now are hoping to downsize and live in a variety of other settings that have to do with smaller houses, more community-based housing, um, and things specifically for seniors. As the text says on the left, this is directly from this study. However, we don't have those units. Um, and so while people would like to move into those, they may end up having to stay in larger units than they would like to be in. What exists for them to move into? Uh, we've got public and private senior specific options. Um, and this is just senior specific. I know we have lots of other options in town. Um, so we have about um, uh, 114 public, that's not about, we have exactly 114 public and 738 private units, uh, of which those of that 738, uh, 423 are independent living. The others are, are much more specific care kind of giving units. Um, and you can see here that for the uh, 114, there's two, nearly 3,000 people waiting um, for those units. So vast under ability to serve this group. I should say, I forgot to say earlier, the town census says that there is 5,200 people in Amherst over the age of 60. Um, and so for that, we have approximately, you know, 800 specific senior units in town. That is not to say every senior should be in a senior unit, um, but that is what is available. Uh, I was pleasantly surprised in um, in the report from this working group on age and dementia friendly Amherst 
and it's a draft. Uh, I'm grateful for being shared the draft, but the draft goal three is to provide support and assist with alternative housing models to enable Amherst residents to safely age in place. And I highlight three actions that jumped out to me. Um, explore alternative living arrangements, provide assistance in education in finding different housing options, such as home sharing or accessory dwellings, um, and consider pursuing a program such as Nesterly, which screens students to rent rooms from older adults. I'll talk about Nesterly in a second. So what this all did in my mind is about eight years ago, I went to an exhibit at the National Building Museum in Washington, DC on housing, the creative housing solutions that were popping up around the country. Um, and house sharing or home sharing was one of those that really caught my attention. And it feels like there's potential here in Amherst for it to uh, be a win-win for the problems that, that we are seeing. So I wanted to, to just jump in there. Um, oh, before I do that, I did meet with Haley Bolton at the Amherst Senior Center this Monday. Um, she verified and helped fill in some of the, made sure I had all those units um, correct. Um, and she said, for sure this, you know, what I just shared with you reflects what she's hearing and what they're seeing. Uh, she did want to emphasize two points. One is the importance of community and connectedness. And she shared these two data points on how um, loneliness or isolation can have devastating health effects. So 50% increase in the risk of dementia, 26% um, risk of early death. Um, so really stark statistics. And then what she's really hearing, and again, it was reflected on this survey, is that people who are trying to age at home are struggling with high property taxes, um, burdens of keeping up their house, and their kids are far away, and often their partners, uh, or potentially for some, their partners ha are deceased, and so they are, are living alone and aging alone. So uh, home sharing, what home sharing is, um, it's essentially, uh, in many cases, they, someone who owns a home who has extra space will rent out a room to someone else. That's pretty basic. Um, what makes home sharing unique in many ways is that they often reduce the rent in exchange for very specific contracted support. Um, this is never nursing or medical care or personal assistance. This is stuff like shoveling the driveway, mowing the lawn, uh, cleaning the bathrooms, doing grocery shopping or taking people grocery shopping. So, you know, housework. And for that, you get either free or reduced rent. Um, and the rise in these, I'll talk about it in a second, um, but um, most home share programs in the U.S. actually do focus on matching younger renters or, you know, Ma uh, home sharers with a, uh, older adults who own their home. I think that's just based on types of people who typically own homes, um, but th I think it would be very specific and appropriate for Amherst's demographics. There are nonprofit and for-profit versions of these. The two big for-profit ones are Silver Nest and Nesterly, which was called out in that earlier report. Um, I'm going to highlight Home Share Vermont in the next slide. It is just representative of all of these nonprofits around the country that do this. Um, they're all pretty similar. But they, whether they're for profit or nonprofit, they provide background checks, contracts, uh, safe ways to meet. They often provide the liability insurance, et cetera. Um, and the benefits of this is, you know, if you do have a situation like Amherst does in my mind, uh, where you've got uh, a lot of unused parts of houses around town and a lot of people who would really like to be living in those houses. Um, it can be a better use of all that space uh, without having to build new things. So it's a, a much quicker solution than building a whole new complex. Helps seniors stay in their homes, provides lower costs for renters and reduces isolation on both sides. The Vermont example, um, so the state of Vermont provided about 140,000 general fund dollars every year to this group, and it was matched by federal funds of uh, 184,000 a year. And they estimated that this allowed uh, individuals to save over a million dollars every year. 
um, in housing costs. The You can see from this little uh, picture, the average age of the person who owned the home was 75 and the average age of the renter was 50, which is not that young, uh, might be very different in our demographic area. The They helped 257 people with this amount of money. Um, they created nearly 200 home shares. People stayed an average of a year and paid an average rent of a shocking 262. This is slightly old data, but uh, not sure how that worked. Uh, maybe Vermont's just a very different place. So um, the, just to close on that, I should also share, this is something I have personal experience with. I grew up in Amherst in a single family, low income home. Um, and my mom rented out a room for free to graduate students so that I would have childcare while she was working after school. And so it worked really well for us. I think it's part of why it clicked for me is that I have uh, very positive memories of it. The other thing that seemed like an interesting um, alternative solution is co-housing. This is something you guys might be more familiar with because there are co-housing um, places in Amherst. It is intentional community is what they like to call it. Um, so your basic, I, I, the reason this came up for me is I stayed in a friend's co-housing community in Tacoma Park, Washington for two weeks this summer. Um, and so I got to experience what it looked like firsthand and how it, it worked. Um, and so you have a bunch of privately owned um, units that then share responsibility uh, with very clear contractual elements and bylaws about how they uh, collaborate on taking care of everything and then building their community. So, you know, the place I stayed in had a gym and a workshop and a TV room, and there was weekly happy hours and they watched Rachel Maddow together and the kids had a dance party on Friday nights. Um, and there was a really nice mix of seniors, young families, middle-aged people, um, very intentional in that way. There are about 300 that either exist or are starting in the US of these communities. The two in Amherst are Cherry Hill, which has 32 units and Pine Street, which has 11. Um, if you look at the Cherry Hill numbers there, you'll see 15 non-member residents. There's usually very strict bylaws on the percentage that can be rented out. Um, most are owner occupied. Um, if you look at the two pictures of our Amherst co-housing, you'll notice that they're, they're detached homes. Um, and I put the picture of the one I stayed in in Tacoma Park because it is not. It looks a lot more like the kinds of housing we're looking at at the Southeast Street School, uh, Belchertown Road. Um, it's a single building around a courtyard. Um, and I think that it, it, certainly it's a much better use of space if that's a concern. There are senior specific co-housing. Um, I didn't really look into them because I think part of the benefit is really the mixed intergenerational aspect of it. Um, but this community, Oak Creek community had listed out these as the benefits. Um, you can see for seniors specifically, you can see that most of them are about social and um, community, but there are uh, bits about appropriate size of housing. So, you know, less, space that you need to take care of, less things you need to fix. There's more shared responsibility in that. And that is also related to the cost savings. And I pulled out that it, their estimate is that it's about half of what typical senior housing costs. I think that's it. Um, so the, the sort of so what, why I thought it was interesting for the Affordable Housing Trust um, is, you know, it is certainly something like in the Vermont case that we could be supporting financially if such a thing existed. Um, if we want it to exist, we could be actively bringing it in. The, the Senior Center does that age and dementia working group does have it on their list of things that they'd like to bring in. So it could be a, a sort of a joint project with them um, on spurring either a nonprofit or a for-profit group to get involved in Amherst. Um, uh, co-housing does require building usually. Um, and so that's a much, it's a longer term solution, but something that maybe we can um, keep in our back pocket as we're thinking about how to design these things. Um, the, uh, the one that I stayed in was 75% 
affordable housing by bylaw. Um, and that's so you can design it to be affordable co-housing. Um, and sort of the oldest member was in her late 80s in a wheelchair um, and living independently in that community very happily. Um, and so, yeah, I'll open it up to questions or I, I definitely rushed. <laughs> Thank you very much. First of all, I'm sure there are questions, but but that was really great. We should thank you so much for doing that. The great way to go out. <laughs> uh, it looks like Ashley had a question for starters. Well, I was, I mean, it's a bit of a question, but then also one way of not starting from scratch is starting with an apartment complex. It's like if, you know, Amherst has a lot of land and a lot of empty buildings. Those can be apartment complexes that are turned into co-housing, you know, whether we build or buy a, a building that turns into an apartment or is an apartment or is an old hotel. Anything could be a co-housing is what I'm saying. We don't have to like start, you know, from nothing. Is that, would you say that's true, Risha? I mean, I'm not a builder, but I, I think, yes, the the structure it tends to be very intentional because obviously you do want those shared spaces. But I, I imagine that, you know, a lot of the places that are being looked at, the old school in South Amherst, et cetera, you know, there, there's always potential for someone who's good at that stuff. Um, I think it's, I talked to the people who started the one in Tacoma Park and it's about a two year process to form the community, the the building isn't the hardest part. Um, it, it's figuring out the bylaws and how you're going to do that and where you get the funding and the developer usually leads you through the process. And um, so I don't I don't know much about the building side, I guess, is my answer. To that. Right. I guess I, I was just saying without building, it's totally possible even if we don't build anything, we just take over another apartment or an empty like a school could be apartments we don't even have to build is what i'm saying it could yeah. be cheaper than building it could be it could be something could be adapted to be that instead of built from scratch certainly i yeah. just wanted to add that the one other sort of at least quasi um co-housing thing that exists in amherst is pomeroy lane which was built as a cooperative as a as a co on a co-housing housing model so there's a common house and various common things and it has a lot of kinds of affordabilities and diversities built into the structure of it um because it was a tax credit deal was the way they got the money to do it then for a while it was kind of only quasi uh a co-housing but it had its own board it had its own it had its own um uh kind of governance structure and i believe now that the initial tax credit time is is finished uh, it still functions that way but it, in order to get the ongoing org that needed it had to continue to have some kind of a management company in there it couldn't completely be mm -hmm. doing everything on its own but it it's a great i lived there for a while um it's a great model of there's income diversity, there's uh, racial diversity, um, ability diversity kind of built in to, to the model. It's a good thing. Yeah, I, I think I was really struck that there's there's a whole continuum, right? Like every condo has some level of shared space. And, right. Um, and so what what brings you to that point? I don't know what qualifies you at that end versus just shared but uh, i believe yeah. what i've seen is a continuum uh other questions or comments i guess um i'm kind of struck by the idea of the home sharing model i really think that could be something useful for especially the student population who have been having a hard time finding places to live in amherst and maybe clashing a little bit with the neighborhood when a bunch of them are just in the house together. Um, yeah. But I also am just kind of struck by like our population, maybe some of the people who are, you know, elder homeowners might have like, couldn't you build great connections with like, oh, hey, this is a retired professor who's renting out a room and like, 
let's build this bridge. And now we have students that are studying what you used to teach. Like, I feel like that could be a very wise way to build bridges um, in the community. So I, I like that idea a lot. Um, if there were homes willing to host in that sense. Um, and again, if they're getting a little bit of income and a little bit of housework help, and that's part of the deal, and it's all screened and everything, it seems like that would really be a positive experience for everyone. Uh, I had one, I had a question about the uh, Vermont. Risha, do you know anything about what was the source of their federal funding? You said they got federal and, and kind of state and federal matching funding for a bunch of years. Let's just be. Yeah. I, mean, I, could... I don't know more than that. That was all I could find. Um, I'd be happy to, you know, reach out and try to get more connection and have, you know, if, if there was something that we wanted to really pursue on it. But um, yeah, yeah just, okay. I mean, it's pretty old data too, right? 2016. So yeah. Um, would be interesting to hear what's happened. But I, I feel like, again, to, to Allegra's point, I mean, the hardest bit to me seems to be finding people who trust the system enough to bring in people that that they feel good about and sort of starting it. Once you hear that your neighbors did it, that it feels like it can sort of take off. Um, and I think the only way to know about those issues is to talk to the communities who did it and started it and how they got that stuff rolling. I don't know. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. And Rob, it looked like you wanted to say something. Yeah, I guess I had a, a, a similar question on the other side. Um, what what exactly is the for profit model? Who 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 pays? I mean, who who is the uh, contractee, and and um, what services does does the contractor provide? Do you know? Yeah, I mean, I assume you take a cut from both sides. It's possible you take it from just one side so that either there's a finder's fee or there's a, I get 10% of the, the agreed upon market rate. I don't even know because you might not be paying any rent, right? You might have decided that, you know, the space is worth having you take, you know, do the house cleaning every full time. Um so there, you know, there's probably fees maybe to sign up or to list, and then the the services they provide, they're pretty clear about, which is that they um, they provide the contracts, they help with the negotiations, they allow ways for people to find the matches and set up those initial meetings that don't involve strangers coming into your house to, you know, scope it out to rob it later. I don't know. Um, <laughs> so it, it's more, it's really on the safety and liability side that they're. Um, in is addition, there a role to, for oh sorry, no. Is is there in addition to be like a listing. The... Say it again. Is there a role for the municipality in in this arrangement? Like, like what would it mean for Amherst to bring in Nesterly or or whatever? It's a good question. Yeah. I, I I think probably to make a business case that it's worth their while. Um, more than anything else. Yeah. Thanks. Um, Ashley? Well, so it sounds like this could just be a click on the Amherst Town website and we it it wouldn't it doesn't involve building anything. It's like getting older people to rent out their rooms could be like a little box on the Amherst Town website and it's like anybody could do this, you know, individually, but a company could come in and like help people do it and and all they need is a little bit of advertisement it's not like a i mean we could invest in them but it's like the the homeowner is making the money in general if they're paying a little we could just kind of recommend people use this service it's a service more or less right that part where you I mean, just rent like older people rent out rooms I think the yeah, I don't think it's a very expensive thing to run. I mean, I'm not sure what the three hundred thousand that Vermont used per year went to. I assume there's a website with all the listings on both sides and a sort of an algorithm to match people who are looking to do this with that. And um 
and but I suspect the vast majority of the cost is liability insurance. Um, well, okay, so uh, I'm just like there just seems to be so many like great ideas. Some only need like a little help on the website, and some need to be built. And it it just it's like what's the mechanism we have to get all these things going? Tiny houses and co housing. We need to do these things. You know, they're all great. Let's do them. <laughs> You know, like, well, I, I, I mean, I, all the ideas. <laughs> I, I want to give Grover a, a chance to talk, but I would just say maybe the first step in this one would be to find somebody who would be willing to do some to talk to the people in Vermont who've done this and ask them more questions of the kinds of questions we're now asking each other, none of whom know the answer. <laughs> but if there's somebody who wants to take that on, that would be that would be great. And Grover. Yeah, thanks for this presentation, Risha. And it sounds to me like, well, the home matching program is both interesting to me and gives me pause. There, it's it's socially complicated, right? And so, uh, I think I imagine it would be most successful in what it sounds like Vermont is doing, which is like there's an aspect of community education and advertising that would need to happen. Because for people to change their ideas of like how they're living or what they're doing with their homes, for example, or who rents out homes, like we need some repetition, right? And some storytelling of success stories and things like that. And then also a facilitator, like like we're talking about a company or a nonprofit to match people, but also um but also I imagine there's, yeah, some of these te like technical assistance needed to like develop it as a model of rental in our town of like, yeah, like liability insurance, like what is it to be a person who's living in your home and you're trading labor in part for rent, right? There's, it, it, it can get, com it feels complicated a little bit um, to have like live in, in care. So I'm just naming that as it sounds like a great idea. And also I think that, it, yeah, it, it would involve some intentionality or I'm thinking if we if we join other entities in the town to do a push of like affordable housing education or like housing solutions education, like the student problem and the, the senior phenomenon, right? Like this, as you're saying, ties them together. So it seems like an interesting opportunity and also that there might be other pieces of our town or our community that would be helpful in facilitating it forward. Um, and also it made me think of this as this, it also made me think that the both the co-housing and the home sharing model are good examples of things to think of when we're thinking about zoning law in the future. Um, and zoning policies, which isn't exactly our purview, but we are able to like have conversations and, and opinions. And, you know, there's a way in which co-sharing a home, I think, could have a little more clarity if a, if it was easy to subdivide a home in the like rural outlying places into a duplex, for example. So then for COVID reasons or other things, right, then there's some clarity of space, even if the person renting out the other side is also caring for our homes. So I just want to note that and like put a marker in it as we're moving forward. I, I should say I reached out to Nate um, before this meeting to just check if there was any sort of town policies that zoning, you know, that was in contradiction. And uh, neither of us could think of any, any, except that depending on which part of town you're in would depend determine how many units you could build, for instance. Um, the the house sharing, you know, you can do that without telling anybody. Um, there There is no, you know. Yeah, um, the house sharing, that's true, but I think that, um, I think that more people would opt into it if they knew that if things were not going great, they could have a door and a separation. Yeah and a kitchen that you know like that everybody is not actually sharing the same kitchen and bathroom and and such right like i i imagine there would be more adoption if it was easier to subdivide our homes in simple construction ways yeah. like a, a quick and i think that's what the accessory dwelling stuff is supposed to cover but again this 
you're, we're, we're getting into the areas that I feel very not confident about my knowledge in. Well, that's okay. Thank you everyone for some good ideas. Unless there's something really burning that somebody wants to say, I would like to move on to our next topic, which is uh, a report on how we're doing with the strategic planning process. Um, does that sound okay? Moving on. Uh, so Grover, would you like to start us off? Sure. So Erica and Carol and I have had a couple of meetings and conversations. And just as a reminder, the goal is for us to have a series of hopefully proposed in-person conversations as a trust to talk about what our individual priorities and goals are, and then from that determine our collective priorities and goals and update our strategic priorities as a trust. And we um, got a suggestion to look into support from the Massachusetts H Housing Partnership, um, where they have a staff member whose expertise is on supporting housing trusts. And her name is Shelly Goring. Sorry, Shelly, if I am not getting your name correct. And um, she does technical assistance for housing trust. And conveniently, they have um, an application for support, basically, for support for towns to do specific projects like the one that we are talking about. And so uh, Carol and I, Carol sent a few questions to get some more finalized information about that, but we would like to submit the very quick application um, saying that we would like technical assistance support in facilitating these meetings and compiling all the information and conversation and then putting it into our future goals. And that application is due pretty quickly on October 2nd, but the good news is, is that we would know back, it says the second week of October. So we would know pretty quickly whether we got the, the you know, if our application was taken up by Massachusetts Housing Partnership, and then it would move forward at, along our goal timelines, basically. Carol, anything to add? Uh, not so much. I talked to the person, she just, Shelly Goring, on the phone the other night, and she seemed like she had just quick off the top of her head some suggestions that seemed like oh yeah to me like how many goals do you have don't you want to have something that's measurable and manageable and so you can tell what you're doing and not have so many goals that it's practically the same as not having anything at all that's my words the last little part the first part was her um but uh i i it made me think that i would like to do this application which i had kind of thought the directions in it say that it's supposed to be kind of a project that you're ready to work on. But the, but I'm, so I thought that meant a housing project, but she said, no, it means our, our job is to support affordable housing trusts being effective, being the most effective and best that they can be. And so if you are trying to engage in a process to get clear on what you're actually trying to do, that's the kind of project that we would like to support. So I believe that we have uh, reason to be hopeful. The application is, isn't is too particular. It's a couple of pages and it. I, I don't know. Anyway, it seems since we have to be writing the Community Preservation Act proposal right now, and then this thing is kind of like a shorter version of the same thing, maybe, I don't know. So uh, anyway, I would like to have, I would like to see us be able to do this. And so we're kind of, have some discussion, but we're hoping that you all will vote us the authority or whatever it's called to go forward and submit this application. Um, Ashley. Yeah, I'm, I'm totally in favor of it because 
we have no mechanism at the moment to be effective. Like, there's no way that I can see that the town of Amherst is accountable for this, all these ideas and utilizing them. Like, we need to figure out how to actually get the town to do things. And so we need all the help we can get. Of course, let's get experts. How does how do affordable housing trusts get their town to do like several very effective multi-leveled affordable housing projects that literally help the amount, the mass amount of people that we need to help? We need all the help we can get even trying to figure out how to do that. For sure. Uh, would you like to turn that into a motion so that we can yes, go forward with this? Let's, let's just vote. <laughs> uh, so, Rob. Writing the letter. Writing the letter. The motion is to write the letter and get all the help we can to actually get affordable housing in Amherst. ASAP. <laughs> Come on. Can we just call it the application since that's what they're calling it to write the application? Yes, write the application. Yes. Can we vote on that? If I, Rob had his hand up and then I think so. If there's any discussion, is there a second? Second. Somebody said second. I didn't see. Oh, Allegra. Okay. And then Rob, did you want to say something or am I? Yeah, I was, I was wondering if you could contrast or compare um, this this uh, opportunity to the one you were talking about last last month, um, the the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission um, deal. Like, is it the same or? I'm not sure. Uh, Grover, do you want to say something, or you want me to? Uh, I can. Uh, go I for think it. the the so the one we were talking about last time is a person that Erica has worked with before that would be capable and probably very skilled at facilitating us in a conversation and, and also capable of translating our conversation into some written final product that we could use. The difference is, is that this person is an expert in affordable housing trusts in Massachusetts and also that there's an application for it to be us to have her services for free and not use any of our funds to pay for it. So it seems like a win-win to us. Thanks. Any other comments or questions? George Ryan has his hand up. Uh, let's see, George, let's allow him to talk at least. Go, George. I just wanted to present a motion and language and make sure that it reflects what you are doing, um, other than simply submit an application, which is not a motion. Um, so let me just read this and then you can correct me or, or we can get straight. To instruct co-chairs to submit an application to the Mass Housing Partnership for technical assistance in preparing its strategic plan. Is that what you want? Yes. I, I would just change co-chairs to the members of the strategic planning committee because okay. it's the co-chairs and Grover. <laughs> this okay. is the committee. So, so I to the members of the strategic plan. I'm sorry, what is that again? Strategic planning committee? Group or something, oh, yeah. Strategic, okay, planning group, thank you. Okay, is that the language is, is what you like then? Yes. Good, thank you. Sounds good. Uh, I, second, I second that, can we vote? We yeah. are going to now vote, but we're gonna, well, I'm gonna ask each person for their vote in the whatever order your pictures are on my screen, starting with Allegra. Yes. Carol. Yes. Risha. Yes. Rob. Yes. Grover. Yes. Ashley. Yes. Uh, the motion has carried six to six to zero. So um, we will move on to we may move on to the legislative update that John always presents, except that I heard from John just before the meeting that he's sick and he's not going to be here. I believe everyone has received his 
recommendation. And so I guess the question is, without him to lead us through this and tell us why everything he's suggesting is so important, but hopefully we've read it. Do we have, can we, is there a conversation here? Are, do people want us to step in on some of these things or at least write a letter in support of them, which is what we've done in the past? Comments, conversation, Ashley? I just, I guess I don't understand why we even think about these things. It seems like the legislator, legislature and Maura Healy is so beyond us i mean in terms of like they are like you know not just because they have bigger jobs but also they're kind of like more progressive and smarter and they're doing things statewide that is very pro affordable housing amherst is like 10 years behind them so or you know not just years but like a lot of progress behind them it seems like all those things are good and we should just you know, I would authorize Carol and Erica to write any letter they want in support of legislature that is pro affordable housing because literally the state is like doing stuff that is beyond us. We have to catch up. <laughs> we're not like they're not we're not helping them that much. We and it's taking our time. Um, I guess I just want to make one comment to that that I have heard repeatedly from our our representatives in in town in state government how much it's helpful to them to have people write things in support it gives them some place to stand when they're talking about whatever they're talking about to everybody else so uh it feels to me like it's kind of yeah it's doesn't do, do a lot but it doesn't do, which is not very hard to do either exactly so so Oops. i will shut up and see who else wants to say something who else has something to say please grover um uh well i hear you ashley and i like part of me agrees with you is like yeah let's just like do, do, do. yes 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 and i think there's some value in us all six of us like looking at the document and being like oh okay yeah that's a piece of it okay that will help if this were to be passed that will have this and this is some money oh i didn't realize that we were like not being reimbursed for public lands which take up the vast majority of our beautiful slightly rural right like you know the things like that and I think that it is valuable for public education for the you know 10 people listening in um to like understand how state policy can help us move our agenda forward and also I agree this is the last I'm going to talk on it because I have no objections and I think every time it comes up if, if we did it quickly because we all support oh, it but it will be quick. but we don't need the explanation no, we don't need, we i just think we're taking up time with like john explaining things he can send us emails and we could say yes we all want it and then we could do it in like 30 seconds <laughs> we don't so need let's see time. let's see what we can do about this one is there any i don't even know if the people who are attendees know what we're talking about mm -hmm. one thing is the mass id access bill and the other is an act to reform payments in lieu of taxes for state-owned land which the argument is Western Massachusetts had just not been getting its fair share of that. And there's a bill up that would hopefully try to fix that somewhat. And it's obviously it seems if more money comes into the town then there's more money for all kinds of things that the town wants to do, including affordable housing. So that's what we're talking about. And I just, if there's anybody else who wants to say anything, please Allegra speak. Um, so I agree with Ashley and I agree with Grover. I think that obviously all of the things that John sends to us, I trust John. He's done this for a long time. I think he has his pulse, you know, his finger on the pulse of affordable housing statewide. But I also think, so I, yes, like I agree we should give the chairs permission to do things in between meetings that would be in line with things that we have already discussed or things that we know would further affordable housing. But I do think Grover's point is important in that it can serve as like a public education piece in terms of, okay, these are some of the bills that we, we hadn't even really thought of, but these are coming up and this is a piece that we hadn't considered about how to, you know, get more funding into this town. So I guess my one question was, 
like, you know, the town council meeting has their packets that they post before the meeting. Do we have our packets posted online? I know we get the documents, but is, are we, <laughs> sorry. I <laughs> wish, <laughs> I, I wish, or we don't even have, I hope we hire a town planner soon. I, we don't even have on our website page, anything that's up to date. Right. If you go to look at something on our website page, you will find things from a bazillion years ago and not much of anything else. At least that's been my experience. So um, I think we should. I mean, the town council has a sole special place where they can post things and get things and mess around with things. And we don't. So there is a place where it could be. There is a place where agendas and minutes are supposed to be and eventually get to be. But I'm not sure that unless the things are attached to the minutes, which mm -hmm. George and Rob, when they've done the minutes, have been trying to attach the things that are relevant, that's the way that it gets available to somebody in the public that I'm aware of. If someone knows something different than me, any place, anybody, anywhere, please raise your hand and speak. But that's my understanding. So could we have... <clears throat> Could I just start a motion that says we take no more than five minutes for legislative agenda. You read it. It will be posted eventually when someone gets around to it. And then we go, we move on, we vote and we move on because it is taking our time. And the legislation is like 10 light years ahead of us. <laughs> like we have well, to catch up. It's not useful. Would, would you accept a friendly amendment? Is this something kind of like what the town council does? We could have what we would call kind of our consent agenda. That's what they call it. And so we could have it at the beginning of the meeting or somewhere in the meeting, we could say, we will act on these legislative things. Is that okay? And if yes. there's no dissent, if there's nothing to be said, then that's done. But it gives people the opportunity to say something if they have something to say, which I don't want to. I don't want to cross that out. So, right, but I don't want all those things explained ever again. I just want to read them. I like. I really. I don't want to take up the time. I want to do that. Consent, you know, collective consent, vote, and move on. Right. And so the only time there will be conversation about it is if there isn't consent. Then there has to be some amount of conversation. But that hasn't. That really. I don't yeah, know. Every yeah. once in a while, somebody's had a question, but so that's that's so. This is a motion, I believe. Let's see if we okay. can make it into a motion uh, for George, or maybe George has an idea of how to make it into a motion. Grover, I okay. I have a I have a concern, which is that I didn't realize what re what Allegra brought up, which is that these things that we're voting on aren't visible to the public. So if we don't talk about them, the public doesn't know what we're voting on until afterwards. So that gives me some pause. So but that, means I... that, that means that like, because, you know, basically our little trust has very little, it has no web space. It has, it, we should, we should have a worker, maybe an affordable housing, you know, worker in the town of Amherst would like get some of this stuff done. Like we have no education you know, piece, because we're not doing the education piece. We're not doing a lot of these things. <laughs> it's not like, there's right. a lot of things not getting done, but we are wasting time on all these legislative things, which are not kind of like not our business because they're going to filter down to us in like two, three years. And probably we're all for them. And I don't want to take 15 minutes or 20 minutes ever again to like explain each one that isn't like even, they're not even kind of like housing things necessarily. It's just, it's it's a waste of our time. Um, I'm not, I'm uh, Allegra. <laughs> so I guess I'm wondering because like on our agenda, I'm just going to look at it again, but I'm pretty sure it just says legislative updates, but perhaps if we could change the way the agenda is written a little bit to, to include at least the names of the bills that are being discussed. Sure then that would um that would educate a person to say okay i'm going to go look up this particular bill and they can do their own research i mean it is nice to have john's little like blips about it um but again i think unless there's a mechanism for us to have a packet 
published beforehand so that people who are viewing the meeting get the link and can see the packet right there. It, it seems like a, a happy medium could be to at least include. You know what? Let me, I just want to say one thing that maybe not be clear. All of us get, when, when the agenda goes out, all the materials go out with it. The other thing that happens is that we have an email list that has, uh, I don't know, somewhere near 100 people. I'm wondering if all the people who are attendees are on that list, and I might ask them to raise their hands if they are or something. That would be nice if you don't mind doing that, folks, and then take your hand down so we can count. But that list also gets all of the materials that we get. So I send out something that says, here's when the meeting's going to be, here's an agenda, here is here are the materials. Sometimes if something goes out late or something, I don't like it's such a long list. I don't like sending more than once to that whole list. So like Risha's piece didn't go to everybody because I got it later. And so I just forwarded it to us and I didn't go to everyone else. But at least at least one, two, three, three. I know Laura Baker's on that list. She's not probably Anyway, and I think some of the happy. people who are attended who are attendees are are on that list, and so it isn't that no one sees it, but it could be seen more broadly. I'm sure. Yeah. Thank you all for participating in my hand raising activity. So can we can we do that motion that like, you know, making the agenda more, you know, like more explain explaining more in the agenda is great can we use five minutes or less to have a collective consent we vote on it and if there's no if there's no dissent we just vote and if there is some dissent someone says something and we just i don't even need to hear the names of the bills i'm sure they're great so then we vote and then we we're done because this is taking our time away from stuff in amherst that the legislator is going legislation is like 10 light years ahead of us they're they're doing more stuff than we are doing <laughs> we're doing this stuff um so is there a mo is there somebody who can make this into a motion that george can write down it sounds like we have two separate motions okay oh. first motion is for us to expand our legislative updates agenda section to have subheaders with the legislative bill numbers that we will be voting to support collectively yeah collectively yeah mm -hmm. and so that's one motion i second that one motion <laughs> okay I have, Let's vote on that. Oh. Um, well, I have one concern, which is if Nate were here, I think he would say he is he we give him this draft agenda, Erica and I, and then he is always determined to make it fit on a page with a heading and a blah, 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 because that's how it's supposed to be or something or other. So uh, <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I think he would he would say so long as I can fit it somewhere. And George is probably what what George. I'm not sure we really need a motion for this. I think you're simply instructing uh, the chairs to uh, follow a certain procedure. Uh, as long as it gets in the minutes and the chairs understand what you're asking them to do, um, it's not some kind of formal uh, statement or action. It's just uh, you know, in the future, would you please do X? Um, so I think as long as you're clear on what you're asking and the chair is clear on what she's being asked to do. Um, yeah, I don't think you need a motion. That's okay. my okay. humble opinion. But the second, yep. maybe that needs to be a motion is that we don't spend time hearing about each legislative thing and it takes our time. Like we just figure that you can read it and on the agenda and then we vote unless there's a dissent. And then we talk to that one person who has some kind of dissent. Otherwise, we just immediately vote, and it takes two minutes. It seems to me, maybe, that that could also be instructions to the chairs as a way to handle something. That is correct. Please, yes. 
please, for the legislative updates that we have, make sure we have the information in advance and see if there's any dissent. And if there isn't, move on. If there's right. something that somebody wants to get. Perfect. Is that is that understood? If there's no dissent, we don't hear about each one. We just vote. Not just and dissent. If, if, you, if someone has a question about it, I mean, just because we get materials doesn't mean we understand them. I'm saying that we don't need to understand them. I'm for all those laws. Okay, well, I vote against <laughs> well, them. I think it's okay for people to have, we have to let people have questions if they have questions. I, that's the sure. only way it works for me. Cause if people have, some people don't need to know, maybe some other people want to know. And so that both of those things have to be possible, I think. Perfect. If someone has a question, we answer it. Otherwise we vote. Anybody need to uh, anybody need to say anything else? I'm just curious if we could put it right after the um, minute approvals mm -hmm. and then it will just be one practice and then the next to say next, do we have the board's approval for the chairs to write in support of the statewide legislation? First, we'll pause and ask if anyone has any questions and then we vote. Perfect. Look how quick that was. <laughs> yeah, it might be. Um, I think that the, the legislative stuff will be tend to be bigger sometimes than other times in the year because of what's going on in the legislature. But yes, it can be it can be call to order minutes legislative hoo-ha if there is any and if are there questions comments or are we in agreement and if, then we go on that's fine i think yeah. george have you got the sense of that and it will be in the minutes as sort of instructions to the chairs <laughs> he's laughing george go ahead yes, and you can hear me laughing yes i'm uh, uh -huh. <laughs> I, will do, I will do my best and i will consult with the chair uh, on the language um i think you need to move on but uh, okay. I will make sure the language gets cleared cleared up. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, then I think we are moving on at exactly the moment that Dave arrived, perfect timing, to uh, town updates, where as we were just talking about, we're hoping to hear whatever there is to hear about the housing planner and um, whatever else it is that Dave is going to report on, hopefully in maybe about 15-ish minutes. So we have time for the other things on the agenda. Go, Dave. Sure, thanks, Carol. Um, I don't think I'll need 15 minutes. I don't have too many updates tonight. Um, my apologies. I, I was actually at the CPA meeting earlier this evening um, and also the Board of Health meeting. So uh, kind of a big night for meetings here in Amherst. <laughs> I think there's six or seven meetings tonight. Um, uh, in terms of the housing planner, we have a number of applicants for the position. Uh, I did discuss with Carol and Erica a week or 10 days ago, um, having one of them sit in on those interviews. And uh, I think they will be scheduled in the next two weeks. So we just need to coordinate with Carol or Erica who will be sitting in on those and we'll get them scheduled. So we're kind of optimistic about that. As most of you know, it is a very, you know, uh, nationwide challenging uh, applicant, uh, challenging hiring uh, climate. So uh, we'll keep our fingers crossed that we have some folks who, um, we already know they have some experience and they're interested in Amherst and hopefully they'll bring uh, something to, to our team. So that's exciting. So I think interviews will be in the next two weeks. And and Great. Carol, I don't see Erica here. Maybe she's not here tonight. Um, she won't can... be back until September 22nd. She's on vacation in Peru. Oh, wonderful. That sounds like so, a wonderful trip. So maybe it, if you yeah. are available, Carol, it can, you, you can be that person. That'd be wonderful. Um, there really aren't any new updates on the VFW. I saw that on your agenda. We are still proceeding with um, the hazardous materials um, uh, uh, inventory has been done. I believe the survey is done. 
and um, we then would would take a look at this fall schedule, probably in November, early December, for some sort of community um, community visioning uh, meeting, which you know I would hope the trust would you know co-sponsor with us or co-organize with us, uh, you know the town and the trust. Uh, pulling that group together. So that would include any community members, other boards and committees, um, nonprofits, of course, uh, folks like from Craig's Doors. I've already talked to Tim McCarthy about it, uh, the executive director, and he's uh, on board 100%. So those are the quick uh, updates. I, I noticed that data, there was a data um, um, item on your agenda and honestly I I didn't know Nate couldn't be here until late this afternoon and I wondered what that data request was um I I, I know that Nate's worked on some updated um, affordable housing numbers for you but I just wondered could you, could somebody tell me specifically what you were looking for there I believe he sent us an updated um SHR list because the town has asked to have some things added to it so he sent that and what the other thing we were wondering about was how the work that we started a while ago that tries to take this shi thing and say so how many of these units really are affordable so we have an actual affordable count um as well as the count that we know is the one that the state uses to compare us to everyone else and that we should if we're comparing us to anyone else we need that number but in order to know how much affordable housing we really have, we need the other number. We wondered if there was an update on how that project was coming. It was, I think, George, actually, and Nate and Ashley at some point were working on it. And I got as far as not quite getting it to match the new SHI numbers earlier today, but I haven't finished because I didn't get it to match. I mean, didn't get it so that the number, some of the thing, some of the places we know, the uh, the SHI says 130, but there's 20 of them that are affordable, and, and we want that information. We want more too. We want to know how many, how many units are, how big, and how all that kind of stuff. But if the start is at least how many units are on the SHI thing, which is subsidized housing inventory. And how many of those units are actually affordable? Those two columns we were close to having a while ago. And the build out of it to get further, where I don't know where that is. So we were asking for an update on that project, which I yeah, Nate's not here, and so I understand that you don't know Dave, and we'll we'll uh, ask the same question again probably next time and see how we can do. Nate did send the revised or updated. Uh, supported housing, subsidized housing inventory to us. I know Ashley wants to jump in here, but just if I could squeeze in um, um, the SHI. Yeah, so I know Nate's working on this. The SHI really doesn't change all that frequently. So that's not something that changes weekly or monthly or anything like that. But um, I do know that he was working on kind of that delta, that difference between what's on the SHI and what are the, you know, for instance, rolling green. We have X number of units at rolling green. Um, only Y number of units are truly affordable. What is that delta between, although we get to count all, I think there's 100 right. units at, at rolling green, how many of those are actually, um, actually uh, affordable, uh, permanently affordable? I don't know. I mean, it is quite a huge project to probably get into what size the units are and things of that sort. So I, sure. I'm going to be a little cautious about promising that level of detail. I, I don't know as that's a huge priority for us right now. <laughs> I think that's a long. I think that's a long term. A long term goal. The short term goal is those two columns. Here's yeah. what the SHI says. And so it's the same list, and you can see that number, but next to it is here's the actual number of sure. affordable no, units. And we totally... were close to that. I thought we were close. Yeah, I thought I we thought were close a while ago. Different. And it, the new SHI that he sent has different, does have some more things included in it than the one where I had got them to match. So anyway, it's a work right. in progress. Nate's not here. But that's the thing. That's what we were talking about, anyways, Dave. So and let's, Ashley, let's, 
Yeah, go ahead. So I I getting this over time. The town is not recording the number of units that are 30% AMI and less, 50% AMI and less, tax credit units. You have all these projects and there's no spreadsheet or Excel sheet that has exactly how many affordable units each place has and in what category as you go on. Because it would be better in a general sort of way to do it as you're going. Like, why not with each project that is permitted, it has to be permitted for like 12 units of 30% of AMI or under, 12 units of 50%. You're not even capturing that. I get it, as I, as I, as I can tell. Because then you would know exactly, because you'd put it in the Excel spreadsheet as each place gets permitted. And also maybe the permitting, you know, stuff doesn't even have that. Like you'd have to go back and look at maybe like physical records because you're not keeping any kind of electronic, oh, we have five 30% AMI. And then it's like, if you're not capturing that stuff, isn't there a Massachusetts law that you have to have 10% affordable housing? How would you ever know? If you can't, if we don't know the numbers, how do you know you're, you know, like compliant to Massachusetts law? Massachusetts law uses the numbers in the SHI report. That's what they use. And that isn't really affordable units, but that's the law. The law 10% is based on the numbers in that report. That's why <laughs> that's there. But <clears throat> A reasonable request seems to me to be, as we go forward, please record this information about new projects as they occur. We could do this with East Gables that's just coming online. It would be easy to start a spreadsheet, start it there, go forward with it. And as time allows, we can fill it in backwards for the things that are already there. But there's not any reason I agree with you, Ashley, for not right now, doing it to the things that are coming online. We can do it now, starting with what we've got and what we know. Is this making sense to you, Dave? Yeah, and no, I wish Nate were here because he really is the expert on our data as well. And and I, I agree it's 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 a little too hard. We should have more of this data readily available. I did just want to remind Ashley I think you referenced ten percent as the law. There is no law. There's no law in Massachusetts that a community has to have ten percent affordable housing. Many communities don't. Uh, in fact, I don't know if it's the majority don't. Um, Amer certainly is following the law and the requirements of DHCD to record. You know, DHCD accepts all of our projects, and that's how the SHI changes. So we have been at, above. 10% for my guess is the last 20 years. Is that our goal? No. For many communities, just getting to 10% is their goal. And they, but many of them. That 10% is the SHI number. So it's actually probably one tenth of that because I, you're, you're I think it's better much, than that. But yeah, it's much, much better than one tenth. And I think Nate is very close to that data set. So let me. You know, let me, let me, and Carol, you and Carol and, and Eric and I meet between meetings. So we'll see if we can have that data set for you guys to look at and, and then distribute before your October meeting. Because I think we're pretty close on that. Okay. But not, not the SHI number, just to reiterate, the SHI number is wildly inflated affordable housing. It does not reflect actual affordable housing. What you will report on by October, our meeting, is the actual number, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but would, it will would... tie to the SHI number, in my opinion. So we know so we know we're looking at apples and apples and not some other it's not yeah. hard to take that list yeah. and have the other list right next to it. So you know what you're yeah. looking at. I, I do want to clarify, <laughs> Ashley, and just push back a little wildly wildly inflated. We're Isn't using true? we're using what the state asks us to report on, and that's what we do. So this is the state's equation. It is not Amherst equation. It is an accepted statewide equation. So that's what we pre present to the to the uh, to the state. Yes, uh, Rolling Green is a great example. Um, I worked on trying to work with Beacon Communities to try to purchase for over $30 million 
um, Rolling Green Apartment, we were going to lose all of the affordable units in Rolling Green Apartments if we didn't help Beacon Communities buy that property. And they preserve those, I'm going to say 40 some odd units. I don't, I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head. You're um, going to find out exactly how many units by next October. No, that's, we that's, will. Like, yeah, we will. Yep. Not the no. SHI. The, oh, the, know it's not the affordable SHI unit. We already, well, yeah. I would happy. like to I would like to stop this right now unless somebody has something new and different to say about it because we're seeing okay. the same things over and over. And Nate is the person Nate, we need Nate here to be here to actually get further. And the only other thing I would like to do is say that Laura Baker has her hand raised and I would like to see if she would like to say something. Oh, I have to let her talk then, don't I? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, um, I'm very keenly interested in this question. It's my pet peeve that when towns permit 40B, all the units get counted on the SHI, even the market rate units. I feel like it's a, it's a, a it's people don't understand that's happening. At any rate, that's when right. we were trying to permit East Gables, um, I did work with um, Christine Brestrup um, to do a quick back of the envelope look at which uh, of the units on the SHI were truly uh, restricted affordable units below 80% AMI. And we were around at that point in time around, I think it was 8.3%. So it was definitely below 10%. Um, and I just think that it's an important thing to educate the community about. Um, it, it just gets bandied about a lot. We're over 10%, but, you know, really knowing how many of those are truly affordable, I just think is an important point. So I encourage you to, to forge on with that. But um, I think it's not, it's not 1%, Ashley, it was, it was, you know, it was up around 8%. So it's, it's, it's somewhere in the middle. Um, but there's definitely yeah. ground to be covered to get to 10% of truly affordable units in Amherst. But when someone from Thanks, the town, Laura. But when someone from the town says they know they have 10%, that's not true. They don't know because they don't know the actual number. And it could be right. 8% and it could be 6% and it could be 10%. Right. But they right. don't know and they're not keeping track. <laughs> right. Well, we're, we're working on that. We're working on that. <laughs> um, well, we're so, not working on it at all. They have to do it. <laughs> It is yeah. being worked on, actually, behind the scenes and not quite so far behind the scenes. And so, yeah. Uh, Laura, do you need your hand up anymore? Can I? No, thank you. I'm going to try to remove to take it. it down. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, somebody else has something to say with name I won't pronounce correctly. So I'm going to let you speak and please start by saying your name. Hi, sorry, can you hear me? Just to check. Yes. Okay, um, hi, uh, my name is Hiro. Um, I am a student at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and a member of the Democratic State Committee. Um, so I'm one of the students who's been organizing around on-campus housing uh, within the past semester. Um, and what I and many others have noticed is that UMass practices are screwing over students and normal residents of Amherst. Housing on campus is really expensive. And even if we apply, we, if we get refused on campus housing, it is usually too late to move off campus. And a lot of people drop out because of this. Um, and most of that is also because of off campus costs. We also, um, you know, as I'm sure you're already aware, uh, a lot of landlords are acting very predatory towards students, um, buying up property specifically to rent to us. Mm -hmm. um, and they're exploiting our lack of options. Uh, it's a really bad sign for everyone, especially non-student residents. So we're organizing here on campus. And I know there's a lot of resentment um, towards students over housing issues because of what the UMass administration decides to do. Um, and as one of the students organizing around housing, I want to repair our relationship with the town because these problems affect all of us. And I hope moving forward, we will be able to work with the trust uh, because we believe that at least some of the housing crisis can be mitigated by putting pressure on UMass to stop making things worse with their policies around housing and are also around enrollment. Uh, Thank we'll you. We'll be more effective organizing within Amherst if we stand together. So I hope you all as members of the trust will consider working with students. Thank you very much. Thank you for your presence and your comments. And 
Uh, let me see if George has something that he wants to say about the minutes. I just need the, the person's name spelled, please, um, and their identification. They had an institutional or a group identification. If she could just repeat that. Oh, that's well. Then, can you see the name, George? Now it's on the screen. It's on the screen. Yeah. Thank you. That's yeah. Great. Thank you. And their their pronouns are also in. Thank yeah, you. Yes, so they down. I didn't see that. Thank you. That's disappeared um, from the screen, I'm afraid. <laughs> All right, uh, I'll, I'll track it down. Thank you. Grover. Um, well, I know we're not at the time for public comment, um, generally minutes, but I just wanted to thank Kairos for for coming and just say that I, I'm glad that to know that there's student organizing and I, I look forward to working with you. Here, here. Um, Ashley. I would like also to thank Cairo and to say that I concur with all of those things and that um, I thought I caught like a tiny part of Risha's saying that half the town is students and we talk a lot about seniors and we have like a lot of senior representation and particularly the town council has a lot of senior representation. We have no student representation in this group or any committee that I can see, and the town council definitely doesn't have any students, they have no representation in their government. And so that's a real problem because we don't hear from them. And affordable housing has a lot to do with half the population of Amherst that has no representation. And seniors have a lot. Thank you. So I would like to move on if we can. Um... Is there anything else anyone needs? Oops, Risha. I'm raising my hand in person because I can't figure out how to do it electronically. <laughs> um, no, I just wanted to ask if there's sort of a follow up. Like, how how can is there a next step that we can work together? Um, is there a way to you know do we want to invite her back them back to a meeting yep. with a particular agenda item? Is there a a you know it it just feels like Yes, absolutely. I'm so glad you came. Uh, I've been hoping to to tie in with some of the work that's being done on campus with your group. Um, and how do we do that? Can we invite them to speak? Would you like to do that at one of our meetings? You're still there, right? Yeah. Oh, yes, I am still here. Um, yes, we are very open to um, continuing to work with you guys. There are actually several um, students here on this call. Um, and there's a lot of people, other people here on campus. Um, we have um, a fair-sized coalition who's been um, working on housing, um, you know, taking direct action, protests and the like. Um, so yes, we would love to uh, stay in touch and uh, bring more students onto uh, the trust meetings. So what is an appropriate thing? Can you Will you send me an email with some contact information if I write this minute and give you my email? Absolutely, yes. My email is curiouscarol, all like one word, at gmail.com. Great, thank you. And I will send you Just email. in case uh, you weren't here at the very beginning, there will be an opening on the trust um, if a student wants to apply for that. That's well, right. If any of you, there, there is a there's a form you have to fill out on the website. If you have trouble figuring out how to do it, uh, you can put that in the email and I'll help you figure it out. Thank you. Great. All right. Um, I think maybe we're ready to move on. The next thing was going to be an updated financial report which mostly Nate would do, but I can say this much from looking at it and from what Nate gave us. Everyone got this, right? Oops, what did I just do to my screen? I lost everyone. There we are. Uh, the financial report that Nate had, everyone has looked at, right? And so it has the 300, says there's $375,000 that we committed to Ball Lane. And I went back to look, it's $75,000 that we also have committed over three years for the housing planner. So that number, 
I'm not, and I'm not quite sure where these things come out of. I don't know if Dave knows better. I need it. I didn't hear back from Nate. My guess is hopefully the $75,000 can come out of those two lane lines where there's 68 and 55 and doesn't have to come out of uh, development. But that means that we have something like 474 left. And I thought it might be useful to just know this, uh, where we are financially before we do the next thing on the agenda, which I believe is Dave has a request from the town for funding for stuff related to the VFW. Is that correct, Dave? Yes, I I may have I may have um, forgotten that that was on your agenda tonight. Um, <laughs> you can wait; a, we don't mind. <laughs> you know, why don't we Why don't we wait till next meeting, and I'll put something okay. in the meter eye. But, okay. but we do have a, a request for a few thousand dollars to help us with the VFW project. It turns out that we cannot or we cannot use ARPA funds for a lot of the kind of due diligence and and maintaining that site over time. So. It's a, it'll be a request in October for a few thousand dollars to carry that property until we uh, we know uh, what we're doing with it. So we'll, we'll come back to you in October. Okay. And, um, okay. Um, I think that leads us, let's see, to the CPA Community Preservation Act proposal that is due on the 30th. Um, I have started to try to work on it. I. Kind of, I did it last year. I did it last year by copying and pasting a lot of stuff from John and also doing other things with it. I'm doing a similar thing, taking mine from last year and adding a bunch of things, things that we have done this year, things that seem to make sense, trying to put together something again. And uh, that was the other reason for looking at where what money we have is that I'm not exactly quite sure what is an appropriate amount of money to ask for this time? I have no idea what other housing um, activities are going to be uh, proposals. I mean, last time we knew, we knew Ball Lane was going, we knew Belcher Town Road was going, we knew a lot about what the other housing things were. I don't, at least I don't have that knowledge at the moment. Um, so, when you take away the things that we have already promised, we've got like about $475,000, but I would like to ask for more. And the grounds are things like what Dave is just take, talking about. Who can do that? Who can do some of the pre-development work at Strong Street? It's all the same kinds of things. They're all in the proposal before. I guess what I would like from the trust at the moment is two things. One is a uh, kind of instruction to go ahead and do this proposal and get it in by the 30th. And the other is if there's a couple of people who would be willing to help me with the draft, I'll draft it, but I'd love to have some people who would look at it, think about it, make it better than I do it, manage to do it by myself. So if there are some people who would be willing to to uh, look at it after I have, after I've worked on it some, I would be grateful and pleased that it, yes. Ashley. Is that in CPA, like just in the basic application, can we put the things that we like, would like to see new projects, a tiny home project, a co-housing project, things that we, you know, we don't, I'm not saying we know the details, but I'm saying that, these are things that we would like to be getting money for so that when we even start on like actually doing this project, we have some money, whether it's tiny houses or co-housing or, you know, senior living, whatever it is. Well, that's part of the point is that we have the money for whatever it is. We will, we have never been, and I don't think suddenly are going to be the major developer of, of anything. We have never, positioned ourselves that way. And I don't think we're going to start to now because because we couldn't. I don't think we have the capacity or the funding. Anything that we've done is our money is heavily leveraged. We put in 50, whatever, $375,000 into Laura's Baker's project, or it's not anyway, the 
Valley Project at Ball Lane. And that's like, I don't know, maybe it's 10%. Maybe it's not even, I don't know. I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but it's a very small part of a huge pie. And it leverages that rest of that pie because our piece, the people who are doing the act, the heavy lifting of the development can say, see, the town is supporting us. They're supporting us financially. The town is here in this project. And that gives them leverage for the big state funders, like whatever it's called, DHCD or something, Department of whatever that is. <clears throat> so... I will. I'm going to see how how it is to get some of those things in there without trying to say that we're going to do them because that's. I don't finding, think that's the point. Right. We're just we're hiring developers. So if we hire developers for something, we can hire a developer for a tiny home house. We can hire a developer for co housing. We're just finding different developers. Let's write it I so that we have a lot of money to hire lots of developers. I don't even know that we are going to be the people who hire the developers. It's going to be the town. I don't know who's going to hire the developers. Uh, who hired? In the case of like some of the things that Valley has done, they've just decided to do this with the help of the town and the support of the town and the support of the trust. Well, and we have not. We have not. We're not. I don't. I don't think this is a good conversation to have right now, really. But if you would like, if you want to. If you want to look at what I'm doing and see if you can figure out how to get in some of the things that you're talking about or help me figuring out how to how to get them in that is in a way that I think will uh, enhance our our application. Um, that's fine. That's great. Yeah, I don't even know if it has to be part of the application because even Laura Baker's there. We could ask developers to, you know, for proposals for the things that they want to do and then, you know, read them and see if we can include them. Uh, I uh, did. Can we talk about this some other time? I mean, that's not that we can't include part of the point of the money that we get is that we can get money that does not have to be for a specific development. And it doesn't have to be because that leaves us in a position where we can do things like perhaps provide the money that Dave is about to ask us for, uh, be able to provide to East Gables the money that they needed quickly and more than they thought they did because everything cost more and they needed it now and they couldn't wait for the next CPA application process. We can do things with the money that we get that can't be done by other entities, but it but we don't have right now things where we can say, here's all the things we're going to develop because we we don't and we aren't going to find a developer to do that between now and September 30th. And I'm going to try to have someone besides me and Ashley have this conversation by asking Allegra. Um, so I guess my memory of previous CPA proposals has been not necessarily what we would use it for. It might be like Un unrestricted funds for housing development as you know as they come about but I think it's helpful to outline some of the things we have spent money on in the past year yes. especially since we did just give a big amount of money um you know a larger sum than we had originally thought and a large sum in comparison to you know our regular budget but I think that also shows like hey we asked you for x what did we get last year 250,000 225 I think yeah hey you know we actually used more than that on one particular project so like give us more <laughs> give us half exactly. a million give us all the money um <laughs> but you know I think I think having the list of like these are the things that we've been able to right. help fund with your assistance in the past year is helpful um but yeah, yes. I, mean, I think I think all of Ashley's suggestions for what we could be doing are great. But I think leaving it as unrestricted with, you know, we've had a lot of discussions about different ways to build out affordable housing in Amherst could be a way of blanketing it. Um, and I'd be happy to take a look at it after you. Thank you very much. <laughs> I will take you up on that. Um, Risha. Yeah, I was just going to say that maybe the fact that we don't know what's in the queue 
uh, is a reason to ask for more because it, it means that the, the requests are going to come in out of this cycle. Um, it, it, it feels like we're just at a time when a bunch of stuff has happened and we're at a, a pause and then stuff will happen again. And it might be a, a reason to actually have more um, money when, when people need it down the road. So I, so I ask like for year, ask for more than rather than less. Well, last year yeah. we really did know what who else was asking, and there were a lot. And so it actually might be that there aren't as many because these projects started with the funds last year, or they may have additional expenses that they're going to ask for more for. But it just feels like if given that you know difference in what we know, it might make sense for us to be able to help people outside of a normal CPA cycle. Good, yeah. good point. Thank you. Um, anybody else have anything they want to add? And uh, do I have at least thumbs up on getting this in by the 30th with whatever mm -hmm. help I can? OK. All right. Then I believe we are. <clears throat> um, down to some bunch of announcements and any other public comment. So let me first see if there's any other public comment. Is there anyone who hasn't spoken who out there who wants to say something? Uh, if you think of something while I'm making announcements, feel free to continue with by raising your hand and we'll, we'll get to you. Um, there is a mass housing partnership training Thursday the 21st that's next Thursday I think and it's it's specifically about um affordable housing trusts so there's part of it that's how do you set them up how do you figure out their missions there's like three different sections and if anybody can go to it I believe it would be a great opportunity to figure out more about how the 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 entities that we are one of work and what we can do and such things as that um there's a chapel region regional housing meeting on thursday october 5th there is drum roll the east gables open house um 1 p.m friday on 9 22 rsvp is needed by is that tomorrow? I think RSVP is needed by 915. That's tomorrow. So some of us went and saw it while it was kind of only half dressed, I would say. And uh, we promised Laura, at least some of us did, that we would come back when it, when it could be presented in all its full glory. Anyway, I hope people will go. It'll be kind of just fun to be able to see the completed something that we had a hand in making happen. Um, there is also another MHP thing on October 17th uh, in Sunderland. It's from 5.30 to 6.30. It is, there was a, Nate sent around a flyer about it, and it's a combination of a walk through something and then a round table for people who are trust members or setting up trust to kind of talk about how do you get things done? Um, I don't have anything that I didn't anticipate within 20, 48 hours. I don't, I think that that's kind of, that's kind of it. We might actually be done a tiny bit early, which would be fine with me. Does anyone have anything else that they want to say like Risha? I just wanted to ask if anyone was going to be able to go to that housing 101 training um i i would not go but if if no one else can go i might go just and then come to the strategic planning meeting because it feels like a really useful base so just checking if anyone else can go are there people who are planning i'm planning to go to part of it i don't know if i can do the whole day but i'm planning to go to part of it is anyone else planning to go to any of it and just raise your hand if that's a possibility. 
Um, Ashley. Um, well, I wanted to mention that, you know, the the thing we had at um, the Bangs Cultural Center, I thought was going to have a follow up meeting where we were going to create a report and I had never heard about that again. Is there any report being made? And I thought we were going to meet in person to do that. And then I never it I, I assume it was not scheduled or, or someone didn't tell me. <laughs> You weren't left out of anything. I don't. It ha, as far as it got, is Erica wrote up a lot of notes. I think she sent them around to everyone in some form at some point, and we have not gotten further than that. That's where we are. And then, as I far as I know, so but but that's a good thing too. I will put it on this list of things for future possible future. Oh, I should have read that. Well, I will after we see whatever anybody else wants to say. Some possible future things. But Dang. I also I thought that we even had another in-person meeting that did some, like, you know, psychoeducation about affordable housing possibilities. Like, we've had, in my time, like, you know, two and a half years or so, one in-person meeting that had any, you know, any educational component and it's actually in the charter to do education with the community. And it's happened once in like, you know, three years, if not 10. Oh, there were, uh, there was talk at the beginning of having another, of having another in-person thing. It hasn't happened yet. That's so, that's what I know. So, so how many, so I'm putting it on this list of things that needs to be followed up about. I agree. We should figure out, we kind of did in test and expect to do things that we have not yet done about it. And so I put it on this list of things that need to be followed up about. And could we follow up with how many educational anything the trust has done in the last 10 years? Like, should we, we have we have that somewhere there? Are, there have been things that we have done in the last couple of years, even as well as however many years. Um, some of them are in the last oldest, some of them will be in the new Community Preservation Act uh, application, and some of them are in the one that we did last year. There have always been some in every one, I think, um, are they're listed there. So, And you can go on the Community Preservation Act website and read our proposal from last year and anyone else's proposal from last year, if you so choose. Grover. I'm going back to the question about, is anyone attending the training? I wanted a little clarification about your question before I answered it, because I cannot, I'm planning on attending the Massachusetts Housing Partnership training on affordable housing trusts, but I can't attend it in real time. I'm going to view the recordings afterwards, so I've signed up for it. Very good. All right. Yeah, that's attending it. As far as I'm concerned, <laughs> that counts. Uh, anybody else have any other comments? I will read this list of things. Uh, possible future agenda items. One of them is a presentation from Craig's Doors, which they would like to do. Again, I think they might come to the October meeting. Our next meeting is Thursday, October 12th via Zoom again. And uh, strategic planning is moving forward. And now we have uh, perhaps a, also a time when we will hear from the UMass students who are organizing about housing at UMass. That's another future agenda item, as well as following up on the banks activity or just or just the educational piece that is that should be a part of our jobs that i i know has happened once in the time i've been here and perhaps there was something that says it should happen at some interval i mean maybe there's nothing and so you just do it whenever you want but i think that i think that maybe we should figure out how often do we need to offer an educational piece to this and then do that. That sounds like something we might decide when we're doing our strategic planning is an important thing. 
right now it's it's generic it's just education as part of our mission well, um any any anything else anybody wants to say about something that has to do with the trust <laughs> well then uh thank you all for your attendance and attention and and we even get to leave 12 minutes early so enjoy your wonderful 12 minutes that we just saved for everybody <laughs> thank you all thanks to everybody and have a good night thank you everyone